Hello there. Welcome to part two of an ASMR reading from Terry Pratchett's The Light Fantastic. And uh, just to briefly mention where we left off last time, uh, Rincewind, who is a young, young wizard from the Unseen University, and Two Flower, the first tourist in the world, have just fallen off the back of the Discworld and have landed in a forest. And I will give just a brief... I'll, I'll read a little bit from the end of where we left off, and then we shall go from there. The day lengthened. There was no sound but the murmur of nasty little stinging insects, the occasional crackling of a falling branch, and the whispering of the trees discussing religion and the trouble with squirrels. Rincewind began to feel very lonely. He imagined himself living in the woods forever, sleeping on leaves and eating... eating... Uh, whatever there was to eat in the woods. Trees, he supposed. And nuts and berries. He would have to... Rincewind! There, coming up the path, was two flower, dripping wet but beaming with delight. The luggage trotted along behind him, Anything made of wood would follow its owner anywhere, and it was often used to make luggage for the grave goods of very rich dead kings who wanted to be sure of starting a new life in the next world with clean underwear. Rincewind sighed. Up to now, he thought the day couldn't possibly get any worse. It began to rain, a particularly wet and cold rain. Rincewind and Two Flowers sat under a tree and watched it. Rincewind... Um, why are we here? Well, some say that the creator of the universe made the disc and everything in it. Others say that all it's all a very complicated story involving the testicles of a sky god and the milk of a celestial cow, and some even hold that we're all just due to some random accretion of probability particles. But if you mean why are we here, as opposed to falling off the disc, I haven't the faintest idea. It's probably all some ghastly mistake. Well, do you think there's anything to eat in this forest? Yes, said Winston bitterly. Us. I've got some acorns if you like, said the tree helpfully. They sat in damp silence for the moments. Rincewind, the tree said trees can't talk, snapped Rincewind. It is very important for you to remember that. But you just heard Rincewind sighed. Look, he said, it's all down to simple biology, isn't it? If you're going to talk, you need the right equipment, like lungs and lips and vocal cords, said the tree. Yeah, them, said Rincewind. He shut up and stared gloomily at the rain. I thought wizards all I was I thought wizards knew all about trees and wild food and things, said Two Flower reproachfully. It was very seldom that anything in his voice suggested that he thought anything of Rincewind other than a magnificent enchanter, and the wizard was stung into action. Uh, I do, I, I do, he snapped. Well, what kind of tree is this? said the tourist. Rincewind looked up. Beech, he said firmly. Actually, began the tree, and shut up quickly. It had caught Rincewind's look. Those things up there look like acorns, said Two Flower. Yes, well, this is the Sicily or Heptocarpic variety, said Winswind. The nuts look very much like acorns, in fact. They can fool practically anybody. Gosh, said Two Flower. Um, what's that bush over there, then? Mistletoe. But it's got thorns and red berries. Well, said Winswind, sternly and stared hard at him. Two flower broke first. Nothing, he said meekly. I must have just been in misinformed. Right. But there's some big mushrooms under it. Can you eat them? Rincewind looked at them cautiously. They were indeed very big and had red and white spotted caps. They were, in fact, a variety that the local shaman Udho at this point was some miles away, making friends with rocks, would only eat after first attaching one leg to a large stone with a rope. 
There was nothing for it but to go out in the rain and look at them. He knelt down, and he knelt down in the leaf mould and peered up under the cap. After a while, he said weakly, "No, no good to eat at all." Why? said Too Far. Are the gills the wrong shade of yellow? <clears throat> no, not really. I expect the stems haven't got the right kind of fluting then. They look okay, actually. The cap. Then I expect the cap is the wrong colour, said Two Flower. Not sure about that. Well, then, why can't you eat them? Rincewind coughed. It's the little doors and windows, he said wretchedly. It's a dead giveaway. Thunder rolled across the unseen university. Rain poured over its roofs and gurgled out of its gargoyles although one or two of the more cunning ones had scuttled off to shelter among the maze of tiles. Far below, in the great hall, the eight most powerful wizards on the disc world gathered at the angles of a ceremonial octogram. Actually, they probably weren't the most powerful, if the truth were known, but they certainly had great powers of survival, which, in a highly competitive world of magic, was pretty much the same thing. Behind every wizard of the 8th rank were half a dozen 7th rank wizards trying to bump him off, and senior wizards had to develop an inquiring attitude to, for example, scorpions under their bed. An ancient proverb summed it up. When a wizard is tired of looking for broken glass in his dinner, it ran, he is tired of life. The, old oh, the oldest wizard... Greyhout Spold, of the ancient and truly original sages of the Unbroken Circle, leaned heavily on his craven staff and spake thusly. Get on with it, with a wax, my feet are giving me jip. Galder, who had merely paused for effect, glared at him. Very well, then, I'll be brief. Jolly good. We all sought guidance as to the events of this morning. Can anyone amongst us say he received it? The wizards looked sidelong at one another. Nowhere outside a trains union conference fraternal benefit night can so much mutual distrust and suspicion be found as among a gathering of senior enchanters. But the plain fact was that the day had gone very badly. Normally, informative demons, summoned abruptly from the dungeon dimensions, had looked sheepish and sidled away when questioned. Magic mirrors had cracked. Tarot cards had mysteriously become blank. Crystal balls had gone all cloudy. Even tea leaves, normally scorned by wizards as frivolous and unworthy of contemplation, had clustered together at the bottom of cups and refused to move. In short, the assembled wizards were at a loss. There was a general murmur of agreement. And therefore I propose that we perform the rite of Ashkente said Galder dramatically. He had to admit that he had hoped for a better response, something along the lines of, well, no, not the right of Ash Kente. Man was not meant to meddle with such things. In fact, there was a general matter of approval. A good idea. Seems reasonable. Get on with it, then. Slightly put out, he summoned a procession of lesser wizards who carried out various magical implements into the hall. It has already been hinted that around the time, around this time, there was some disagreement among the fraternity of wizards about how to practice magic. Younger wizards, in particular, went about saying that it was time that the magic started to update its image and that they should stop mucking around with bits of wax and bone and put the whole thing on properly organized basis with research programs and three-day conventions in good hotels where they could read papers with titles like Wither Geomancy or The Seven The Role of the Seven League Boots in a Caring Society. Trimon, for example, hardly ever did any magic these dates, but ran the order with hourglass efficiency, and wrote lots of memos that had a big chart as, and had a big chart on his office wall, covered with coloured blobs and flags and lines that um, no one else particularly understood, but which looked very impressive. The other type of wizard thought all this was much marsh gas and wouldn't have anything to do with an image unless it was made of wax and had pins stuck to it. The heads of the eight orders were all of this persuasion. 
traditionalists to know mage, and the utensils were heaped around the octogram, had a definite no-nonsense occult look about them. Ram's horns, skulls, baroque metalwork, and heavy candles were much in evidence, despite the discovery by younger wizards that the rite of Ashkente could be perfectly performed with three small bits of wood and four cc of mouse blood. The preparation normally took several hours, but the combined power of the senior wizards shortened it considerably, and, after a mere forty minutes, Galder chanted the final words of the spell. They hung in front of him for a moment before dissolving. The air in the centre of the octogram shimmered and thickened and suddenly contained a tall, dark figure. Most of it was hidden by a black robe and hood. This was probably just as well. It held a long scythe in one hand, and one couldn't help but notice what should have been fingers were simply white bone. The other skeletal hand held small cubes of cheese and pineapple on a stick. Well, said Death, in a voice with all the warmth and colour of an iceberg. He caught the wizard's gaze and glanced down at the stick. I was at a party, he added, a shade reproachfully. O oh, creature of earth and darkness, we do charge thee to abjure from, began Galder in a firm, commanding voice. Death nodded. Yes, yes, I know all that, he said. Why have you summoned me? It is said that you can see both past and future, said Galder a little sulkily, because the big speech of binding and conjuration was one he rather liked, and people said that he was actually really good at it. That is absolutely correct. Then perhaps you could tell us exactly what it is that happened this morning, said Galder. He pulled himself together and added loudly, I command this by Asmeroth and Jekyll by... All oh, right, you've made your point said death what precisely is it you wish to know quite a lot of things happened this morning people were born people died all the trees grew a bit taller ripples made interesting patterns on the sea i, I mean about the octavo said Gal galder coldly that oh that was just a readjustment of reality i understand the octavo was anxious to lose the eighth spell not to lose the eighth spell it was dropping off the disc, apparently. Hold on, hold on, said Galder. He scratched his chin. Are we talking about the one inside the head of Rincewind? Tall, thin man, bit scraggy, the, the one that he has been carrying around all these years? Yes. Galder frowned. It seemed a lot of trouble to go to. Everyone knew that when a wizard died, all the spells in his head would go free. So why bother to save Rincewind? The spell would just float back eventually. Uh, any idea why, he said, without thinking, and then remembered to himself t in time, and, has and added hastily, By your friend Clark, I do abjure thee. I wish you wouldn't keep doing that, said Death. All that I know is that all the spells have to be said together at the next ho Hog's Watch night, or the disc will be destroyed. Uh, speak up there, demanded Greyhold Spold. Shut up, said Galder. Me? No, him, daft old. I heard that, snapped Spold. The young people. He stopped. Death was looking at him thoughtfully, as if he was trying to remember his face. Look, said Galder. Just repeat that bit again, will you? The, the disc will be... what? Destroyed, said Death. Can I go now? I left my drink. Hang on, said Galder, hurriedly. Bacheliki and Orizon and so forth, what do you mean destroyed? It's an ancient prophecy written on the inner walls of the Great Pyramid of Sort. The world destroyed seems quite self-explanatory to me. But that's all you can tell us? Yes. But Hogswatch Night is only two months away. Yes. Well, at least you can tell us where Rincewind is now. Death shrugged. It was, a it was a gesture he was particularly well built for. The forest of Skund, rimwards of Ramtop Mountains. What is he doing there? Feeling very sorry for himself. Oh, now may I go? Galden nodded distractingly. 
He had been thinking wistfully of the banishment ritual, which started, Be gone, foul shade, and had some rather impressive passages which, had been practice, which he had been practicing, he, but somehow he couldn't work up any enthusiasm. Oh, yes, he said. Thank you, yes. And then, because it's well not to make enemies among the creatures of the night, he added politely, I hope it's a good party. Death didn't answer. He was looking at a spold in the same way that a dog looks at a bone. Only in this case, things were more or less the other way round. I said that I hope it's a good party, said Galder loudly. At the moment it is, said Death livily. I think it might go downhill very quickly at midnight. Why? That's when they, they, that's when they think I'll be taking my mask off. He vanished, leaving only, leaving only a cocktail stick and a short paper streamer behind him. There had been an unseen observer in all of this. It was, of course, entirely against the rules, but Trimon knew all about rules, and had always considered that they were for making, not breaking. Long before the eight mages had gone down to some serious arguing about what the apparition had meant, he was down in the main levels of the university library. It was an awe-inspiring place, many of the books were magical, and the important thing to remember about grimoires is that they are deadly in the hands of any librarian who carries who cares about order, because he's bound to stick them all on the same shelf. This is not a good idea with books that tend to leak magic, because more than one or two of them together form a critical black mass. On top of that, many of the lesser spells are quite particular about the company they keep, and they tend to express any objections by hurling their books viciously across the room. And of course, there is always the half-felt presence of the things from the dungeon dimensions clustering around the magical leakage and constantly probing the walls of reality. The job of the magical librarian, who has to spend his working days in this sort of highly charged atmosphere, is a high-risk occupation. The head librarian was sitting on top of his desk, quietly peeling an orange, and was well aware of that. He glanced up when Trimon entered. I'm looking for anything we've got on the Pyramid of Shut, said Trimon. He had been he had come prepared. He took a banana out of his pocket. The librarian looked at it mournfully, and then flopped down heavily on the floor. Trimon found a soft hand poked gently into his, and the librarian led the way, waddling sadly between the bookshelves. It was like holding on to a little leather glove. Around them, the book sizzled and sparkled with the occasional discharge of undirected magic flashing over to the carefully placed earthlings' rods nailed to the shelves. There was a little tinny blue smell just at the very limit of hearing, and the horrible chittering of the dungeon creatures. Like many other parts of the Unseen University, the library occupied a rather, a rather more space than its outside dimensions that would suggest because magic distorts space in strange ways, and it was probably the only library in the universe with Mobius shelves. But the librarian's mental catalogue was ticking over perfectly. He stopped by a, store, by a soaring stack of musty books and swung himself into the darkness. There was the sound of rustling paper, and a cloud of dust floated down to Trimon. Then the librarian was, was back, a slim volume in his hand. Ook, he said. Trimon looked at it gingerly. The cover was sc scratched and very dog-eared. The gold of its lettering had long ago curled off, but he could just make out the old magic tongue of the sort of valley. The words, It great temple he sort, e history mystical. Ook, said the librarian anxiously. Trimon turned the pages cautiously. He wasn't very good at languages. He always found them highly inefficient things, which by right ought to be replaced by some sort of easily understood numerical system. But this seemed exactly what he was looking for. There were whole pages covered with meaningful hier hier hieroglyphs. Is this the only book that you've got about the Pyramid of Sort? He said slowly. Ook. You're quite sure? Ook. Trimon listened. He could hear a long way off the sound of approaching feet and arguing voices. 
but he had been prepared for that too. He reached into his pocket. Would you like another banana? he said. The forest of Skund was indeed enchanted, which was nothing unusual on the disc, and was also the only forest in the whole universe to be called, in the local language, your finger, you fool, which was the literal meaning of the word Skund. The reason for this is regrettably all too common. When the first explorers from the warm lands around the Circle Sea travelled into the chilly hinterland, they filled in the blank spaces on their maps by grabbing the nearest native, pointing at some distant landmark, speaking very clearly in a loud voice, and writing down whatever the bemused man told them. Thus immortalized in generations of atlases such geographical oddities as just a mountain, I don't know, what, and, of course, your finger, you fool. Rain clouds clustered around the bald heights of Mount Ulskanrod. Who is this fool who does not know what a mountain is? And the luggage settled itself more comfortably under a dripping tree, which tried unsuccessfully to strike up conversation. Two Flower and Rincewind were arguing. The person that they were arguing about sat on his mushroom and watched them with interest. He looked like someone, someone who smelled like someone who lived in a mushroom, and that bothered Two Flower. Well, why hasn't he got a red hat? Rincewind hesitated, desperately trying to imagine what Two Flower was getting at. What? he said, giving in. He should have a red hat, said Two Flower. And he certainly ought to be cleaner and more, more sort of jolly. He doesn't look like any sort of gnome to me. What are you talking about? Look at that beard," said Two Flower sternly. "I've seen better beards and then a piece of on a piece of cheese. Look, he's six inches high and lives on a mushroom," snarled Winstrand. "Of course he's a bloody gnome." We've only got his word for it. Rincewind looked down at the gnome. Excuse me, he said. He took Two Flower to the other side of the clearing. Listen, he said between his teeth. If he was fifteen feet tall and said he was a giant, we'd only have his word for that too, wouldn't we? He could be a goblin, said Two Flower defiantly. Rincewind looked back at the tiny figure which was industriously picking his nose. Well, he said, so what? Gnome? Goblin? Pixie? So what? Not a pixie, said Two Flower firmly. Pixies, they wear these sort of green combinations and they have pointy caps and little knobbly antennae things sticking out of their heads. I've seen pictures. Where? Two Flower hesitated and looked at his feet. I think it was the... The what? Called the what? The little man took a sudden interest in the back of his hands. The little folk's book of flower fairies, he muttered. Rincewind looked blank. Looked blank. Is it a book on how to avoid them? He said. Oh, no, said Two Flower hurriedly. It tells you where to look for them. I can remember the pictures now. A dreamy look came over his face, and Rincewind groaned inwardly. There was, even a there was even a special fairy that came and took your teeth away. What? Came and pulled your actual teeth. No, 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 you're wrong. I mean, after they'd fallen out, what you did was you put your tooth under your pillow, and the fairy came and took it away and left a renew piece. Why? Why what? Why did it collect teeth? It, it just did. Rincewind formed a mental picture of some strange entity living in a castle made of teeth. It was the kind of mental picture you tried to forget. Unnecessarily. Ugh, he said. Red hats, he wondered. He wondered whether to enlighten the tourist about what life really was like when a frog was a good meal, a rabbit hole a useful place to shelter out of the rain, and an owl a drifting, drif a drifting Silent terror in the night. Moleskin trousers sounded quaint unless you personally had to remove them from the original owner when the vicious little sod was cornered in his burrow. 
As for the red hats, anyone who went around a forest looking bright and conspicuous would only do so very, very briefly. He wanted to say, look, the life of gnomes and goblins is nasty, brutish, and short. So are they. He wanted to say all this, and couldn't, for a man with an itch to see the whole of infinity, Tuflower never actually moved outside his own head. Telling him the truth would be like kicking a spaniel. <laughs> said a voice by his foot. He looked down. The gnome, who had introduced himself as Swires, looked up. Rincewind had a good ear for languages. The gnome had just said, I've got some newt sorbet left from yesterday. Sounds wonderful, said Rincewind. Swires gave him another prod in the ankle. The other booger, is he all right? He said solicitously. He's just suffering from reality shock, said Rincewind. You haven't got a red hat by any chance. What? Just a thought. I know there's some food for beggars, said the gnome, and shelter too. It's not far. Rincewind looked at the lowering sky. The daylight was draining out of the landscape, and the clouds looked as if they heard about snow and were considering the idea. Of course, people who lived in the mushrooms could not necessarily be trusted, but right now a trap baited with, ho with a hot meal and clean sheets would have had the wizard hammering to get in. They set off. Another few seconds later, the luggage got carefully to its feet and started to follow. Psst. It turned around carefully, little legs moving in a complicated pattern, and appeared to look up. Is it good being joinery? said the tree anxiously. Did it hurt? The luggage seemed to think about this. Every brass handle, every knot hole radiated extreme concentration. Then it shrugged, then it shrugged its lid and walked away. The tree sighed and shook a few dead leaves out of its twigs. The cottage was small, tumbled down, and as ornate as a doily. Some mad whittler had got to work on it, Rincewind decided, and had created terrible havoc before he could be dragged away. Every door, every shutter had its clusters of wooden grapes and half-moon cutouts, and there were massed outbreaks of fretwork pine cones all over the walls. He had expected a giant cuckoo to come hurtling out of an upper window. What he also noticed was that the characteristic greasy feeling in the air, tiny green and purple sparkles flashed from his fingernails. Strong magical field, he muttered. A hundred millithams at least. There's magic all over the place, said Swires. An old witch used to live round here. She went a long time ago, but the magic still keeps the house going. Here, there's something odd about that door, said Tooflower. Why should a house need magic to keep it going, said Rincewind. Tooflower touched the wall gingerly. It's all sticky. Lurgat, said Swear Swires. Good grief. A real gingerbread cottage? Rincewind, a real... Rincewind nodded glumly. Yeah, the confectionery school of architecture, he said. It's never caught on. He looked suspiciously at the licorice door knocker. It sort of regenerates, said Swires. Marvellous, really. You just don't get this sort of place nowadays. You just can't get the gingerbread. Really? said Winston gloomily. Come on in, said the gnome, but mind the door, Matt. Why? Candy floss. The great disc spun slowly under its toiling sun, and daylight pulled into its hollow and finally drained away as night fell. In his chilly room in the Unseen University, Trimon pored over the book, his lips moving as his finger traced the unfamiliar ancient script. He read that the great pyramid of sort, now looked vanish, now long vanish, was made of one million three thousand and ten limestone blocks. He read that ten thousand slaves had been worked to death in its building. He learned that it was a maze of secret passages, their walls reputedly decorated with the distilled wisdom of ancient sort. 
He read that its height plus its length divided by half its width equals to exactly 1.675863, or precisely 1,237.9871256 times the difference between the distance to the sun and the weight of a small orange. He learned that 60 years had been devoted entirely to its construction. It all seemed, he thought, to be rather a lot of trouble to go through just to sharpen a razor blade. And in the forest of Skund, two flower and rincewind settled down to a meal of gingerbread, mantelpiece, and thought longingly of pickled onions. And far away, beset as it were in a collision course, the greatest hero of the disc ever produced rolled himself a cigarette, entirely unaware of the role that laid in store for him. It was quite an interesting tailor-made that he twirled expect expertly between his fingers, because, like many of the wandering wizards from whom he'd picked up the art, he was in the habit of savaging, of saving dog ends in a leather bag and rolling them into fresh smokes. The implacable law of averages therefore dictated that some of that tobacco had been smoked almost continuously for many years now. The thing that was trying the thing he was trying to successfully unsuccessfully light, you could have coated rods with it. So great was the reputation of this person that a group of nomadic barbarian horsemen had respectfully invited him to join them as they sat around a horse toad fire. The nomads of the hub regions usually migrated rimwoods for the winter, and these were part of a tribe who pitched their fine their felt tents in the sweltering heat wave of a mere negative three degrees, and were going around with peeling noses and complaining about heat stroke. The barbarian chieftain said, What, then, are the greatest things that a man may find in life? This is the sort of thing you're supposed to maintain, supposed to say into a maintained step cred in barbarian circles. The man on his right thoughtfully drank his cocktails of mare milk and snow-cat blood, and spoke thus. The crisp horizon of this, the crisp horizon of the steep wind, the wind in your hair, a fresh horse under you. The man on his left said, The cry of the white eagle in the heights, the fall of snow in forest, a true arrow in your bow. The chieftain nodded and said, Surely it is the sign, a sight of your enemy slain, the humiliation of his tribe and the lamentation of his women. There was a general murmur of whiskering approval around this outrageous display. Then the chieftain turned respectfully to his guest, a small figure, carefully warming his chillbanes by the fire, and said, But our guest, whose name is Legend, must tell us truly, what are they that a man may call the greatest things in life? The guest paused in the middle of another unsuccessful attempt to light up. What say? he said toothlessly. I said, what are the things that a man may call the greatest things in life? The warriors leaned closer. This should be worth hearing. The guest thought long and hard, and then said, with deliberation, Hot water, good dentistry, and soft lavatory paper. Brilliant octarine light flared in the forge. Galder Weatherwax stripped to the waist, his face hidden by a mask of smoked gas glass, squinted into the glow and brought down a hammer with surgical precision. The magic squealed and writhed in the tongs, but still he worked it, drawing in drawing it into a line of agonized fire. A floorboard creaked. Galder had spent many hours tuning them always a wise precaution with an ambitious assistant who walked like a cat. D-flat. That meant that he was just to the right of the door. Ah, Trimon, he said, without turning, and noted with some satisfaction the faint indrawing of breath behind him. Good of you to come. Shut the door, will you? Trimon pushed the heavy door, his face this expression, exp his face expressionless. On the high shelf above him, the various bottles 
the bottled impossibilities wallowed in their pickled jars and watched him with interest. Like all wizards' workshops, the place looked as though a taxidermist had, dripped, had dropped his stock in a foundry and then had a fight with a maddened glassblower, braining a passing crocodile in the process. It hung from the ceiling and smelt strongly of camphor. There were lamps and rings that Trimon itched to rub, and mirrors that looked as though they could repay a second glance. A pair of seven-league boots stirred restlessly, restlessly in a cage. A whole library of grimoires, not of course as powerful as the Octavo, but still heavy with spells, creaked and rattled their chains as they sensed the wizard's covetous glance on them. The naked power of it all stirred him as nothing else could, but he deplored the scruffiness of and Galder's sense of theatre. For example, he happened to know that the green liquid bubbling in the mysteriously th uh, through a maze of contorted pipework on one of the benches was just green dye with soap in it because he'd bribed one of the servants. One day he thought, it's all going, it's all going to go, starting with that bloody alligator. His knuckles whitened. Well now, said Galter cheerfully, hanging up his apron and sitting back in the chair with the lion paw arms and the duck legs. You sent me this memmy thing? Trimon shrugged. Memo. I merely pointed out, Lord, that the other orders have all sent agents Scun Forest to recapture the spell while you do nothing, he said. No doubt you will reveal your reasons in good time. Your faith shames me, said Galder. The wizard who captured the spell will bring great honour on himself and his order, said Trimon. The others have used boots and all manner of elsewhere spells. What do you propose using, master? Did I detect a hint of sarcasm in there? Absolutely not, master. Not even a smidgen? Not even the merest smidgen, master. Good. Because I don't propose to go. Galda reached down and picked up an ancient book. He mumbled a command and a creak open, a creaked open. A bookmark, suspiciously like a tongue, flicked back into the, bind into the binding. He fumbled down beside his cushion and produced a little leather bag of tobacco and a pipe the size of an incinerator. With all the skill of a terminal nicotine addict, he rubbed a nut of tobacco between his hands and tapped it into the bowl. He snapped his fingers and fire flared. He sucked deep, sighed with satisfaction, looked up. Still here, Trimon? You summoned me, master, said Trimon levelly. At least, that's what his voice said. Deep in his grey eyes was the faintest glitter that he had a list of every slight, every patronising twinkle, every gentle reproof, every knowing glance, and for every single one of Galder's living brain was going to spend a year in acid. Oh, yes, so I did. Humour the deficiencies of an old man, said Galder, pleasantly. He held up the book he had been reading. I don't hold with all this running about, he said. It's all very dramatic, mucking around with magic carpets and the like. But it isn't true magic to my mind. Take seven league boots now. If men were meant to walk twenty-one miles at a step, I'm sure God would have given us longer legs. Where was I? I'm not sure, said Trimon coldly. Ah, yes. Strange that we could find nothing about the Pyramid of Sort in the library. You would have thought that there'd be something, wouldn't you? The library will be disciplined, of course. Galder looked sideways at him. Nothing drastic, he said. Withhold his bananas, perhaps. They looked at each other for a moment. Galder broke off first, looking hard at Trimon always bothered him. It had the same disconcerting effect as gazing into a mirror and seeing no one there. Anyway, he said, strangely enough, I found assistance elsewhere, in my own modest bookshelves, in fact. The Journal of Skrelt Change Basket, the founder of your order, the founder of our order. You, my keen young man, would, who would rush off so soon, do you know what happens when a wizard dies? Any spells he has, he has memorized says themselves, said Trimon. 
it's one of the first things we learn. In fact, it's not true of the original eight spells. By dint of close study, Skrelt learned that a great spell will simply take refuge in the nearest mind, open and ready to receive it. Just push the big mirror over here, will you? Galder got to his feet and shuffled across the forge, which was now cold. The strand of magic still writhed, though at once present and not present, like a slit cut into another universe of a hot, of a hot blue light. He picked it up easily, took a longbow from the rack, and, a word of, and said a word of power, and watched with satisfaction as the magic grasped the ends of the bow and then tightened until the wood creaked. Then he selected an arrow. Trimon had tugged a heavy, full-length mirror into the middle of the floor. When I am head of the order, he told himself, I certainly won't shuffle around in carpet slippers. Trimon, as mentioned earlier, felt that a lot could be done by fresh blood, if only the dead would be removed. But just for the moment, he was genuinely interested in seeing what the old fool would do next. He may have derived some satisfaction if he'd known that Galder and Skrelt's change basket were both absolutely wrong. Galder made a few passes in front of the glass, which clouded over and then cleared to show the aerial view of the Forest of Skund. He looked at it intently while holding the bow with the arrow pointed, pointing vaguely at the ceiling. He muttered a few words like, a laugh speed of wind, speed of, say, three knots, and adjust for temperature, and then, with a rather disappointing movement, released the arrow. If the laws of attraction and reaction had nothing to do with it, it should have flopped to the ground a few feet away. But no one was listening to them. With the sound that defies description, but which for the sake of completeness can be thought of basically as spong, plus three days of hard work in a decently equipped radiophonic workshop, the arrow vanished. Galder threw the box aside and grinned. Of course, it'll take about an hour to get there, he said. Then the spell will simply follow the ionized path back here to me. Remarkable, said Trimon. But any passing telepath would have read in the letters ten yards high. If you, then why not me? He looked down at the cluttered workbench, where a long and very sharp knife looked tailor-made for what he suddenly had in mind. Violence was not something that he liked to be involved in, except at one remove. But the Pyramid of Sort had been quite clear about the rewards for whoever brought all eight spells together in the right time. Trimon was not about to let years of painstaking work go for nothing because of some old fool who had a bright idea. "'Would you like some cocoa while we're waiting?' said Galder, hobbling across the room to the servant's bell. Certainly, said Trimon. He picked up the knife, weighing it for balance and accuracy. I must congratulate you, master. I can see that we all must get up very early in the morning to get the better of you. Galder laughed, and the knife left Trimon's hand at such speed that, be that because of the somewhat sluggish nature of disc light, it actually grew a bit shorter and a little more massive as it plunged with unerring aim towards Galder's neck. It didn't reach it. Instead, it swerved to one side and began a fast orbit, so fast that Galder appeared suddenly to not be, we to be wearing a metal collar. He turned around, and to Trimon it seemed that he had suddenly grown several feet taller and much more powerful. The knife broke away and shuddered and shuddered into the door of a into the door, a mere shadow's depth from Trimon's ear. "'Early in the morning?' said Galder pleasantly. "'My dear lad, you will need to stay up all night.' "'Okay. I think we'll stop there for today. Thank you for joining me in part two. Um, I'm going to make a part three. I think this was well received for the, f the first part was well received, so... We'll continue with the journey of Rincewind and Two Flower in the next part in a couple of weeks or so. So thank you very much for coming, and be well.